सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली वॉट इज है रेड सी जस्ट वॉट इज रेड सी हाउ डज इट मैटर टू इंडिया हाउ डज इट मैटर टू द वर्ल्ड and what exactly is being done about what's happening there we'll talk about some of that in katta clutter today and i know you've all been following the stories there is a lot on tv there is a lot in newspapers as well so all of you know quite a bit about this i will only start however with an observation just because one reason is the reason i'm inspired to use this observation at this point is that we just just observed the birth anniversary of late shri atal bihari vajpayee so mr vajpayee said once famously when it came to negotiating with pakistan and people said why do you negotiate with pakistan pakistan is keep on provoking india all the time or keep on inciting violence in india or or carry, sponsoring terror attacks in india cross border terror you still keep talking with them or with china and he would say his famous answer was he said that you can't choose your neighbors you got to live with the neighbors you've got you never chose them but they are there now we know that we we've got incredible neighbors who always keep us busy particularly the two biggest ones china and pakistan very interesting no del moment but when you look beyond these neighbors and our land borders right if you if you turn your vision in in a maritime direction we tend to because most of our threats have come from land we have learned over time over the past 7 7 1/2 Ten decades. In fact, even through British times, even through imperial times, because imperial navy, royal navy was so big then that they controlled the seas anyway. That we that our strategic vision, even in our popular idea, popular imagination, we don't look towards the seas. We look towards the Himalayas. We look towards our land borders: Himalayas, Punjab, Rajasthan, Gujarat, or land borders, or on the eastern side. we don't look at we don't think about the seas that much but if we do if you take yourself to the indian coast anywhere on the western side eastern side anywhere take yourself to any point on the indian coast and draw an arc draw an arc towards the seas of a thousand kilometers right that is on the western side arabian sea thousand kilometers will take you to the end of the arabian sea towards africa african coast african coast into the middle east on the other side it will take you towards thailand and beyond if you look at if you look at all those territories of water all those vast expanses of the ocean of the sea all of these are also areas again if you look at these arcs where when something goes wrong or a threat emerges india is expected to play a role i am choosing that word very carefully expected that is because not only is india the most preeminent power in the entire region but also india has the most powerful littoral navy that is navy for a country which is based here in the region littoral navy in the entire region there are stronger navies the us navy is stronger right the chinese navy is stronger but this is the strongest navy that is based in the region that is why you find that what's happening in red sea has immediately attracted the involvement of indian navy as we talk it seems that already about four ships mostly destroyers and remember these are not in red sea these are these are east of babel mandap or gulf of aden so on the arabian sea side and what are they trying to do they are trying to protect shipping now you might say these destroyers are there this is these are wide wide open seas it's not as if there is a hostile navy there so who are they fighting but they are there as a deterrent deterrent to say that look if there is a missile coming in or if there is a drone coming in we can shoot it down they are perfectly capable of doing that however hunting for a drone finding a missile is easier because a missile you can pick up on your sensors your radars on your systems drones are much too small and too slow and too low are not so easy to pick up and also you have to be much closer to the drone so there are those challenges 
but these indian ships have gone out to the sea in the direction of red sea basically to be a deterrent this is where quite a bit of the us navy resources are also there and we know that the us decided to set up the operation what they called as operation prosperity guardian prosperity guardian indicates that that was meant to guard protect global shipping and, and global trade however the coalition they had hoped to build with 10 the navies of 10 countries that did not quite happen so right now the americans are there in the strength that they can manage and right now they are also struggling to get more ships there because as you would know they've also got a bunch of ships in the mediterranean and red sea as well and those ships two carrier task forces those ships are not directed at stopping the houthi missiles hitting commercial shipping those ships are in full combat mode and those are there to serve as a deterrent to hezbollah to hezbollah from escalating the war or getting involved in the war alongside alongside the gazans alongside hamas in gaza to 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 attack israel so americans are there the two us navy task forces carrier task forces are there basically to serve as deterrents in support of Israel to keep Hezbollah out of power. In that process, what have the Iranians done? Because what is Hezbollah? Hezbollah is an Iranian proxy. Even more than Hamas is an Iranian proxy. Because unlike Hamas, Hezbollah is also Shia. Hamas is Sunni, but loyal to the Iranians, run by the Iranians, but also at the same time rooted in Qatar as well. Hezbollah is almost entirely an Iranian operation. So American power at this point is focused in that direction. And if they divert more resources towards protecting commercial shipping in the Red Sea, they'll have to come way south, see the map, how it looks like. They will have to come way south and that will, thin, that will force them to thin out where they are needed. They are needed by Israel and Israel supporting Israel is there larger strategic objective that is the limitation that the americans are working under now we need to understand we need to understand what is red sea if you see the map again red sea you can call it a sea but really it's a pond my apologies if that sound if that sounds like it sounds like a joke or not serious enough but see this this is actually an inlet it's an inlet of the indian ocean which goes which goes northwards and northwards from this very narrow from this very narrow entrance called babel mandab bab means gate so literally a gate mandab 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 can mean lamentation it can mean tears it can mean grief so this little passage from indian ocean through arabian sea into red sea that is what controls access to this entire region now red sea itself for ease of understanding, about one and a half times our state of Rajasthan or maybe almost twice as big as our state of Uttar Pradesh. That is what Red Sea is. It's not an enormous water body. At its widest, it's only about 355 kilometers. You can see that on one side, that on the eastern side, it has, it has Saudi Arabia, mostly Saudi Arabia, a little bit, little bit of Jordan at the north northernmost end a little bit of jordan then he calls a tiny bit of israel that is that is the port city of elak in israel also egypt egypt that is where suez canal opens into the red sea suez canal connects red sea with the mediterranean that is the key thing so red sea actually has two choke points one choke point is babel manda that is right under Aden, between say Aden on the Asian side and Djibouti and Eritrea. That's the Horn of Africa on the African side. So between the two continents, it's a very narrow passage, Babel Manda. That is just about 16 miles or 26 kilometers wide. That narrow. It's really very small. And about, and about 31 miles or, or approximately 50 kilometers long, depending on where you are measuring it. That is, it's literally called, it's been described in history and because of events in history, it's got the name, the gate of grief or the great of tears or the great of lamentation, that is Babel Mandap. And that has also now become 
the gate of grief and tears for global shipping that's passing through this choke point. So that's one choke point. The other choke point is as you go north. As you go north at the northern end of Red Sea is the Suez Canal that was built in the 19th century. Since then, the Suez Canal has been a zone of contention. Earlier, the big powers fought over it. The British, the French, the British and the French also fought with the Egyptians when the Egyptians decided to nationalize it. Now it has been running reasonably smoothly. It is also one of the major sources of income revenue for Egypt. If Suez Canal shuts down, then Egyptian economy really suffers, but also the global economy suffers because it is through Suez Canal and then then across into Red Sea and then on to uh, Arabian, Arabian Sea. And similarly, the other way around, that 12% of global trade by value passes. 12% of global trade by value and 30% of global trade, 30% of global container trade by volume passes through it. So at a time when the Western world is dealing with inflation, when countries like, when countries like ours are dealing with already high struggling oil prices, particularly with the war in Ukraine and multiple sanctions by the Americans and the Western side on Iran, on Russia, on Venezuela, which they are beginning to lo loosen up a little bit. In that situation, if shipping is denied this passage, this passage through multiple choke points, when we, when we talk about India's role in, in ensuring freedom of navigation in the seas and a rule-based order for the past 15-20 years, when we say that, we only look southwards and eastwards, which means we look at the Indian Ocean going into the Pacific. That's why all the talk of Indo-Pacific, the Quad, all of that is directed towards the Indo-Pacific. And the choke point we are looking at strategically is Malacca Strait. You can see it on the map. Malacca Strait from where a lot of the shipping, particularly energy, oil going into China passes. So that's a choke point where China can choke the world, where the rest that th those countries in the world who are at odds with China, which includes India, they can choke China. So that's the choke point that we in India, in our strategic thinking, have been thinking about. Now a new threat has arisen to our west northwest, and that is what that that is the region we are watching. That is Babel Mandap, and then going into Red Sea. It is now that we've been forced to look in the other direction, direction which we are not used to looking at. Once again, this. This is a reminder to India that Indian Navy's responsibilities go far and wide because between Babel Mandap and the rest of the world to the south and the east, the only credible naval power, the local credible naval power is the Indian Navy and India has to be active and India has to be involved. In fact, tomorrow if convoys have to be run through this route with, with under protection, then, and, and, and if a co global coalition of navies is built, India will be needed to play a vital role in it. At the same time, Indian Navy is not the American Navy. When the American Navy is not large enough to do this job by itself, so to think that the Indian Navy will be able to do all this job of protecting the sea lanes by itself, th that is also an exaggeration. So, coalitions will have to be built. And the good thing is that Indian Navy and India has been building these naval relationships, maritime relationships for a long time. Once again, back to the geography and geopolitics to that. Look at Red Sea. If you see the Red Sea, on the one side, on the eastern side is Asia. Most of that side, most of the coastline is the Saudi coastline. That includes, that includes, located there are some, some of Saudi Arabia's most important places. For example, Jeddah is located there. Jeddah is a port city on the Red Sea. Again, not far from the coast, not that close, not on the coast, but not that far as, as a plane flies, is also Medina. So these are the holy places, the holiest places in Islam. Effectively, those are Red Sea places, right? On the other side, that is across Red Sea, on the western side is Africa. Again, these are troubled zones of Africa. There is Egypt, quite stable, no problem. There is Egypt, then there is Sudan. And as you go on after Sudan, there is Eritrea and, and then 
Somalia. So Somalia again is the pirate land. So right now you are in a situation where Houthis are attacking the shipping or hijacking the shipping in Bab el Mandab and in in the Red Sea because after all Houthis are now the strongest military force in that part of Asia. They are they are a stronger military force than the military forces of most many nations there. They have a fully functional air force, right? In fact, how functional that is, you will see. from these videos that the houthis themselves in fact their own tv channel al masira they released al masira released they released this video and you will see some of it running uh, on the other half of the screen of their hijackers landing on a mi8 helicopter in a movie like fashion on on a ship on a commercial ship and hijacking it earlier we had featured this issue in a in a full episode of katta clatter on how much military st strength do the houthis have they have missiles they have fighter planes they have transport hel helicopters they have assault helicopters they have naval naval vessels they have torpedoes they have mines they have mine laying capability they have drones they have hundreds of drones in fact thousands of drones and also hundreds of missiles the chances are as i had said in that episode that probably they have more missiles than indian and pakistani armies combined because indian and pakistani armies if at all will use those missiles in genuine combat between nations houthis on the other hand keep pooping off these missiles also to be to cause nuisance and they are getting these free mostly all from iran so this is almost a situation like ashes to ashes dust to dust if houthis can't get you somalians must because one you have this non state army navy air force of the houthis stocking this shipping and when you escape that there is a somalian pirate groups already trawling in those seas so this has now become a very dangerous zone for shipping to operate and that's the reason so many countries are getting together that's the reason the americans are talking with saudis that's the reason that Narendra Modi our prime minister had a conversation with Saudi crown prince Mohammed bin Salman the Saudis and the Houthis are also talking now because the Houthis who been fighting a war with Saudis for a very long time with Saudis have failed to win despite enormous military superiority now the Houthis also think that they have a bargaining chip and the Iranians also know that they have a bargaining chip and that is where this situation stands right now this is a particularly tough time also for global trade particularly global shipping trade trade based on global shipping because because of drought successive droughts the panamanians have had to also put limitations on how many ships can pass the panama canal because panama canal it's something that we'll talk about in detail at some other, some other point of time unlike this swiss canal panama canal they use locks which means ships coming in from one ocean are then lifted by these locks so that they can be transported to the other ocean those locks need water that water supply is gone down because rains have been less than plentiful of late so that area is already under stress and now this one comes under stress and you know what global shipping global trade can survive without the swiss canal and the red sea route after all it did so for 8 years 8 years after the six day war in 1967 the swiss canal was closed for 8 years 8 years why because then israelis had gone and captured the sinai peninsula you see sinai peninsula on the map it's quite large it looks like a giant dagger or maybe or maybe an inverted triangle depending on how you want to look at it on one side of it is the gulf of suez on the other side of it is the gulf of aqaba both lead lead into the red sea and gulf of suez it is through which the suez canal connects the red sea to the mediterranean now after that war in 67 for 8 years the egyptians had blocked this canal because on the one bank were the israelis and the other bank were the egyptians so the so one bank of the canal was effectively under israeli occupation and to that extent it was an active hostile zone so the world economy survived it and it may survive it again but the costs will be enormous but now 
for this to happen because of the strength of a non-state actor will be an enormous irony. Because again, if you leapfrog the Arabian Peninsula, the landmass on the other side, you have these two seas. You have Red Sea to the west and you have Persian Gulf to the east. And the two are separated by the Arabian landmass or the Arabian Peninsula. It's in the Persian Gulf that between 1984 and 1988, you might remember, another major shipping crisis had erupted. That's when the tanker war took place. Read up more on the tanker war. We will, we will, not, we will need to, too much time to tell you more in detail. But the fact is that that's when the Iran-Iraq war was on. And at some point, they decided to attack the shipping taking each other's oil because they were both oil powers. So initially, Kurt Waldheim, the United Nations Secretary General, made an appeal in response to which the Iranians committed that they will not attack any shipping in the Persian Gulf. But the Iraqis did not, did not follow that advice. In 1984, Iraqis carried out the first attack on Iranian oil terminals on Kharg Island and, and, some, and some ships as well. And after that, the Maramari started. And then it was a free for all. Over the next four or five years, almost 200 vessels were attacked by the Iranians and by the Iraqis. That is where the Americans got involved and the UN got involved when the Americans first of all said that they will come out in defense of Kuwaiti tankers. Kuwaiti tankers were then under attack by the Iranians. It's in one of those supreme ironies that only exist or that only come up in the Middle East. Between 1984 to 1988, US Navy was out to protect Kuwaiti ships and tankers from Iranian attacks, right? Iranians were fighting with Iraq and within a few years from there, that is in 1991, American Navy was back in Persian Gulf, in this case to try and liberate Kuwait from Iraqi occupation. Earlier they to protect Kuwait from the Iranians and now they are to liberate Kuwait from the Iraqis. That's, that's the kind of complexities that this region has, the Middle Eastern region has. On one side of it, as we told you, is the Persian Gulf. The other side of it is the Red Sea. And India, once again, in conclusion, is the biggest power in the region. And finally, I know you are curious, so you must be also wondering, why is Red Sea called so? Why is Red Sea called the Red Sea? Does it look red in color? How did it get the name? So there are a bunch of seas in the world which are named after colors. There is Black Sea that we talk about often between Ukraine and Russia, that's one, Ukraine, Russia, Turkey, that's called Black Sea. There's White Sea in Russia near Barents Sea uh, of Russia. There's also Yellow Sea between China and Korea. This is called Red Sea. This is called Red Sea, one, because it's a direct translation into English from the Greek name, which is Eritrea Thalesa, Red Sea. But it's also believed that one reason it's called the Red Sea is that Instead of the usual blue-green color that most seas and oceans have, this one has a red-brown tinge. And this comes from the large presence of a bacteria. Bacteria in the category of cyanobacteria. It's called trichodesmium, trichodesmium erythium. It's because of this bacteria that this sea, the waters of the sea, acquired a red-brown tinge. And that's how it acquired the name Red Sea.